MFA reader this evening is Carissa Chen. She completed her bachelor's degree in psychology at Barnard College and is currently an MFA fiction student at St. Sarah Laura Lawrence College. Her work has previously been published in Two Hawks Quarterly and Pinley Bows. Oh, Pinley Bows. Mm. That's a great journal. Right now, she's working on a novel, but when she's not doing that, she likes to go karaoke and eat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, who doesn't? Uh, please welcome Carissa Chen. So everyone else has been doing poetry. I am a fiction student. So this is the uh, last third of a short story that I'm working on. And um, the things that you need to know are that the narrator is addressing her boyfriend, who's Korean, and um, she's not. And um, the first time that he ever told her he loved her was in Korean, and that phrase is 사랑해. And um, he's recently begun going to church again, which creates tension between them because she's not religious and his mother wants him to go on a church mission to Cambodia. So this is the last third of that. <clears throat> that summer was hot and humid, like many summers in New York. Our ancient AC blew only a small stream of lukewarm air. So we slept with the windows open and our thin sheets peeled away from our sticky skin. After sex, we shifted so that we had a foot between us, drifting into dream with only our pinkies curled around each other like snails in love. Our stilted silence gave way to tempers that rose with the heat, and we fought constantly. We bickered over dirty dishes, over dry cleaning that hadn't been picked up, over unpaid bills, over insensitive remarks. Many nights, we went to sleep upset at each other, and I lay on my side, refusing to give in to the stinging in my eyes. But once you were asleep, I would slide over to you, press my lips against the curve of your shoulder and lick the salt from your skin. One day in the beginning of August, you came home early and I was pleasantly surprised. I told you I'd just started dinner, but you murmured that you weren't hungry and went out to the living room, turning on the television. I walked out and stood in front of the sofa, annoyed, and soon we were arguing again. I'm so sick of this, you said, jumping up from the couch. Don't wait for me for dinner. Before I could say anything, the door was slamming behind you, rattling the emptiness of the apartment. When you came back, I was already asleep. I felt you curl up against me, your hands in my hair. Hey, you whispered, are you awake? Hmm? I felt the warmth of your breath, tinged with whiskey on my neck. As much as I tried to pull myself into consciousness, I felt the darkness of sleep lapping at me. Go back to sleep, you said. And then later, what felt like years, Saranghe. In the morning, as we got ready for work, you acted like nothing had happened. As we parted at the subway, you butterflied a kiss on my cheek. Halfway through the day, you emailed me. Dinner out tonight? There's an Indian place I want to try. That night, after we'd filled up on appetizer portions of naan and samosas, you leaned over the table and took my hand. Sorry about yesterday. I nodded. I was in a bad mood. I shouldn't have snapped at you. Let's just forget about it. No, wait. You paused. The thing is, you cleared your throat. I was talking to my mama and, well, I think I'm going to go. Go? To Cambodia. I withdrew my hand. It's only for three months. What about work? I've talked to them. They'll give me a sabbatical after this project. I picked up my food. Come with me, you said. I looked up at you. You could come. I can't. You hate your job anyway. Quit. When you come back, you can look for a new one. What would I do for three months with a bunch of Korean missionaries? You pulled your hand back, your eyes wounded. Be with me? I shook my head and looked down at my plate. Lumps of chicken floated in, the cur in curry the color of earth. After a moment, you picked up the fork. Maybe my mama was right. You paused, then stabbed at something swimming in your plate. Maybe some things are irreconcilable. 
On the cab ride home, you didn't try to hold my hand. I stared out the window at the lights of the city. That night, we lay next to each other for hours in the thick heat, neither of us sleeping. At some point, I slipped into uneasy half-dreams, and by the time I woke in the morning, you had already left for work. You left no note. For three weeks, we skirted each other like strangers. You left early, ate your meals at work, and often you came home when I was already curled up in bed. Sometimes I was awake, but would feign otherwise. I could feel you hovering over me, checking to see if I was asleep. Every now and again, you would pick up a lock of my hair and twirl it around your finger, placing it behind my ear. Every now and again, you would whisper words to me in your mother tongue. I never let on, I knew. On weekends, you would go to church and to meetings in preparation for your mission. When I'd heard you leave, I would put on my sneakers and run outdoors, making my way as far uptown as I could take before walking slowly back down to our apartment. Outside, in the suffocating heat, my lungs heaving and my heart bursting, I looked up to the muggy blue skies and waited to feel something. On the first day of September, I awoke to find you sitting on the sofa, dressed for work, staring at a darkened TV screen. Hi, I said, still in my pajamas. Hi. I rubbed my eyes. What are you doing? You looked down at your hands, threaded in front of you, and you shook your head. Okay. I started to make my way to the bathroom. Wait, you called out. I turned around. Happy anniversary. My throat tightened. I nodded. I'm leaving in 10 days, you added, not looking up. My flight's at 8 in the morning. I nodded again. I'm flying through San Fran. It's going to be a 20-hour flight. I looked down at the floor. You won't come? Babe, I said. You shook your head and stood up, picking up your work bag. Have a good day, you said. The morning you left, I woke up startled, jarred from sleep by the slamming of the door behind you. I leapt out of bed and opened the door, but you were already gone. I could smell your cologne still lingering in the hallway. I retreated back into the apartment and swept my hands through the air, trying to catch particles that had touched you. I waited for you to call before your flight took off. I checked my cell phone every two minutes. I wrote you a text, but erased it before I could send it. I'm sorry, the message said. Come home. I tried again. Have a safe flight. I love you. This one I also did not send. Then I typed out over four messages. I don't know why this happened this way or how we ended up here, but I wish you weren't going. I may not understand you all the time, and I may not believe in God, but what I know is you and me can work, and if it really means that much to you, then say the word, and I will jump on a plane and meet you in Cambodia, and I will spread the things I don't believe because I'll have the thing I believe in next to me. And maybe that's what's, what it's really about, and maybe that's what we should be spreading anyway. I read through the words I had painstakingly typed on the little number pad, and then I pressed cancel. At 8 o'clock... When your plane was scheduled to take off, I finally pulled myself off the sofa and slipped into the shower. I started out with the water dial to lukewarm, then turned it up little by little until the tap went as far as it would go. I wanted it hot, excruciatingly hot, so that I could imagine layers of my skin being shredded and dissolved away like tissue paper. When I was done, I got dressed and applied makeup. I put my cell phone and wallet in my purse, grabbed my keys dangling lonely on the hook, and walked out towards the 96th Street C. Then, right before I descended into the tunnels, I wrote you one last text. Last night, I dreamt of the first night you told me you loved me, when you didn't know I knew. What I know now is that we are bigger than this ocean, than this sky, than three words translated from the mouth of God. What I know is that our roads will always meet, and you have always been home. So please, come home. I pressed send and went downstairs towards the subway. 45 minutes later, I was forced to get off at 81st Street with everybody else. As I made my way outside, I found people standing on the streets, many with briefcases or purses in hand, cell phones pulled out, nobody going anywhere. What is it? I asked one woman, a bun in her hair, a gray power suit on. She stood on the corner, tears falling down her perfectly made up face. Planes fell out of the sky, she said through sobs. 
I would not know until late in the evening as the network slightened and messages began to filter in until my phone bleeped four times loudly, jarring me out of foggy sleep that as I'd stood in front of the Museum of Natural History that morning, looking dazedly up at the heavens, you'd been calling me. As I searched through the cloudless sky for evidence of you, as the sun glazed my skin through the baby maples, as the planetarium cast its shadow behind me, you'd left me message after message, murmuring my name like a prayer, as if you'd forgotten that my cell phone was not an answering machine, and that if you recited my name enough times, you would be able to fly through the air, break through the invisible signal jams, and hold me. The last message was left at 9.53 a.m. I don't know if you're at work or you left your phone at home or what, but I can't reach you. I really wish, well, but I, I just wanted to call because, you know, things don't look good. But I want you to know I'm okay. I'm not scared. I'll be okay. I know you don't believe in God and that's okay. That doesn't matter. But hopefully it'll make you feel better to know that I do. And so I'm okay because I worry about you worrying about me, so please don't worry. And Grace, Grace, Gracie, I'm sorry about everything. It all didn't matter. I want you to know that I kissed you this morning before I left and you smiled. I think you were dreaming. Did you know you smile in your sleep? Did I ever tell you that? But I just wanted to tell you, Saranghe, I, I mean I love you. I, I mean, God, does it matter which three words I use as long as you know what I mean? If I can just keep repeating whatever it is I have to repeat until maybe you never understood that the word love just never felt like enough. But if it's all I have, then I do. I love you. I love you. I. Once upon a time, I confided that sometimes I feared leaving you for too long because I worried about the possibilities of death in my moments away from you. What if I were to die, alone, anonymous? How would you know? How would you find out I was gone? I'd know, you said, touching your heart, the same way you'd done when I asked you about God. I'd know. At 10.13 that morning, I looked up into the infinite satin of blue, felt a small shudder of the world, and I knew. Thank you. Can we get another round of applause for our first three fabulous members?